springtime in Japan, where the cherry blossoms bloom and all the small farms begin their planting season. But this spring is special, because on April 30th, the current emperor, Akihito, will abdicate to his son, Naruhito. To people unfamiliar with Japan or its history, this may seem pretty insignificant. In fact, it may even be so for many people in Japan, but we'll get to that later. The imperial family, however, represents the oldest royal family on the planet, so let's take a look back. Japan's imperial family supposedly began with the Emperor Jimmu in the 600s BCE, but his existence is considered by most to be mythical, and his claim of descent from the sun goddess Amaterasu and the storm god Susanoo doesn't help that much. The first verifiable emperor was Kinmei, who ruled a sort of proto-Japan that's oftentimes referred to as the Yamato Kingdom. In the 700s, the emperor Kanmu, not to be confused with Kinmei, moved the capital to what would later become the modern city of Kyoto, where the imperial family would live until the later 1800s. Over time, life in the Kyoto court became a little decadent, and the nobles were more interested in writing poetry and having illicit affairs than actually running the state. Uh, this left room for other families to come in and take power. One in particular, the Fujiwara, ended up maintaining power by intermarrying their daughters within the imperial family. In 1068, the emperor Go Senjo attempted to regain power for the imperial family. His plan mainly included centralizing his finances. Unfortunately, no checkbook balancing would save the situation, and he passed not having accomplished his goal. The next period of time contains a lot of complicated political moves by various clans, but in the quickest way I can sum it up, the Fujiwara were replaced by another clan, the Minamoto, whose family head was declared the Shogun, or military dictator of Japan, and to maintain power, they ended up splitting the imperial house into southern and northern courts, alternating which court to choose the next emperor from. Emperor Go Daigo came to power in 1318 under this system, and he was determined to assert himself to the shogun overlords. He appointed his own son as the successor, thinking, that'll show them who's in charge of Japan, and instead he was exiled. He wasn't a quitter, though, and a coalition of clans supporting him ousted the shoguns and put him back in power in 1333. Godaigo then attempted to pass some reforms to strengthen the imperial family and put it back on top as the head of the Japanese government. But he made one critical mistake. He started taking privileges away from the people with armies, without having much of one himself. Some of the very same people who helped put him in power then took it away, and one clan in particular, the Ashikaga, had themselves proclaimed as the new shogunate. The next period of time stretches for over 500 years, and it would see the clan controlling the shogunate, and thus Japan, change many times. Uh, but through all this time, the imperial family were little more than puppets to the powers that be, used to legitimize each, so each shogun that came to power. Uh, until that is, the winds of change reached Japan. Foreign ships appeared on the coast one day, and before anybody knew it, the Tokugawa shogunate had been forced to open up the country to foreign traders. Traders who would oftentimes abuse their position and use their global military and political power to increase their influence over Japan. All in all, things were pretty crappy, and the samurai clans, who had allowed themselves to rest easy as bureaucrats for the past couple hundred years, began to pick sides. One side supporting, and one side against, the shogunate. In 1863 the Emperor Kome gave an imperial decree to expel the foreigners, which was, to many young samurai, a rallying cry. The shogunate began to struggle to maintain its power and authority over the nation, and soon Kome would pass, leaving his young son to ascend as Emperor Meiji, sometimes often called Meiji the Great. Finally, things boiled over, and the shogun was forced to resign by rebel forces, who then had Emperor Meiji proclaim a restoration of imperial rule. Everyone was really wanting Meiji to lead the nation, and he kind of just slipped into the position. Even so, he managed many reforms, including establishing the current currency of the yen, restructuring Japan into its modern prefecture system, and doing what Go Daigo failed to do, take power away from the people with armies, mainly because he had his own army this time, and it was a modernized one. Even so, many of the clans opted to just give up their lands peacefully, and those that did were given the title of governor. 
Emperor Meiji ruled over Japan during its period of greatest change, and the modern state likely wouldn't exist without his period of rule. However, it is important to note that many say he was still just a puppet to the revolutionaries who occupied most of the positions in government. Meiji's son, Taisho, would take the throne following his father's death in 1912. However, he was said to be a very sickly man and was kept out of the public light. Unlike his father, he had neither the charisma nor did he display anything that could be called intelligence, likely due to a mental condition. For those of you who are unfamiliar, this kind of happens with noble families a lot. It's what happens when your ancestors intermarry. Taisho effectively resigned in 1919 and gave control to his son, who would soon be Emperor Showa, best known to the world as Hirohito. Uh, Hirohito saw Japan through a very interesting time indeed. Uh, at the start of his reign, Japan was already the ninth largest economy in the world and considered universally to be a great power. Even so, the world was now entering the Great Depression, and that would shake up the political stage for nearly everyone. Under Hirohito, Japan would stretch its imperialist ambitions, because, well, what better way to distract people from an economic depression than some good old-fashioned war? Uh, this started with more incursions into China, and ended with the military becoming kind of an entity in itself. While Hirohito and his government still exercised control over the military, it would oftentimes take actions independent of those given or desired by the government. Eventually, this ended with the appointment of the hardline general, Hideki Tojo, as prime minister. As a result, some things kind of happened. Even today, there's much debate over whether Hirohito and many of his family members were responsible for some of the actions taken during the war. But despite this, they managed to escape trial as war criminals, likely as a way for the Allied forces to maintain goodwill with the Japanese people. All in all, the war ended and Japan found itself on the losing side. Uh, under these terms, Hirohito was forced to give up any semblance of political power under the new Japanese constitution, as well as publicly deny the idea that the imperial family themselves were divine in nature, the claim going all the way back to Jimmu. He spent the rest of his rule as a public figure and not a political one. He made public appearances, diplomatic trips, and was in every way nothing more than a figurehead. He passed away in 1989, leaving the throne to his son and our current emperor, Akihito, who on Tuesday will abdicate to his son, Naruhito. That brings us to modern times. The current imperial house owns, kind of, several properties throughout Japan to be used for imperial business, and they are paid for by, well, the government. Uh, the emperor is given a budget of about 197 million US dollars each year, which is about 150 million euro and 22 trillion yen. Holy crap, I wish I had that money. Uh, on top of that, the imperial family also has their own hospital with 42 staff and 8 departments inside of the palace, a massive wine cellar, an imperial guard of 900 men, and even a private multi-million dollar farm that the chefs produce food from. Uh, keep in mind that this isn't paid for out of the 22 trillion yen. This is all covered by the state. To wrap things up, let me just mention one more interesting note about the modern state of the family. The crown prince, Naruhito, will ascend throne on the 30th of April in 2019. However, there is a slight problem in the future for this. You see, he doesn't have any sons. His only child is a daughter named Princess Toshi, or Aiko, as is the name her parents gave her. Uh, she's currently 17, and there have been propositions by many to change the law of the imperial secession to allow her onto the throne since there was no male heir for many of the immediate family members. However, soon a baby boy was born to Aiko's uncle and the proposition to change the imperial law was dropped. Even so, there's a bit of time before the final decision has to be made and political opinion on the subject may even change as new blood takes office in the government. Until then, let's give a warm congratulations to Naruhito and wish the new Reiwa period be one of peace and prosperity.